pushing back the shadows, fighting depression together. Hello and welcome to the Pushing Back the Shadows podcast, episode four. My name is Alex Davis and I'm the founder of Pushing Back the Shadows and the main author behind the Pushing Back the Shadows blog. So in today's episode, I'd like to take a look at some of the the ways that you can keep going um, through your struggle, because a lot of the times you do get to a point where you'll feel like you just want to give up, like you're not really getting anywhere, and that does make it quite hard to, to see that light at the end of the tunnel. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the, the different things that I've put into place or the different things that I've used so that I can keep going in my struggle. Um, some of them are going to be good, some of them are going to be bad, but I'd still like to, to walk you through those and have a look. Um, whether you're somebody who, who does suffer with depression or anxiety, or whether you're somebody who supports somebody in that situation, these are things that, that you can try. So I'd like to just take a look at some of the, the negative ones to start with, just some of the ones that I've tried in the past, um, ones that some of the people going through depression might already be trying or experiencing, and then I'll talk to you about some of the, the alternatives that you can put into place, some of the other things that can help you keep going. Um, but first off, let's just have a look at some of the reasons why you'd feel like giving up. So one of the most obvious ones that I can think of would be suicidal thoughts. It's something that a number of people experiencing depression will go through at some stage. Um, it's where you feel like there just is no point. You, you can't keep living because you're looking for that escape. Um, for some people, it's just they want it to stop. For other people, they just don't feel like they've got the strength to keep going. So it's one of those things um, that a number of people do experience. And um, one of the studies that I read, it was on um, psychologytoday.com, was that apparently 90% of self-inflicted deaths are due to some kind of mental health, um, mental health problem. So it's something to bear in mind. It's a reason why you would want to give up, why you wouldn't keep going. Um, but one of the things that you can do, one of the things, the alternatives that some people turn to uh, would be self-harm. Um, a couple of people that I've spoken to have turned around and said, well, when I get down to it, there are, there are only two options going through my head. Either that I kill myself or I hurt myself. So let's have a look at self-harm, because for those of you who've read um, Pills and Blades, one of my blog posts on the blog itself, you'll have seen that that was something that I have turned to in the past, um, and also more recently as well. It's been one of the, the ongoing struggles that I've had. So back on the 12th of June, I was reading an article um, up on on one of the internet sites uh, is a blog post by a woman named Teresa Larson and it talks about her son's struggle with depression and his struggle with self-harm as well and one of the things that she asks is is self-harming a coping mechanism or is it a maladaptive coping mechanism in other words is it something that actually does help or is it something that is just like a, a helps in the short term, but actually can be detrimental in the long term? And it was quite interesting to read um, to read that perspective on it. It's not something that I've had an opportunity to explore, really, because while I'm good at explaining the self-harm and the reasons behind why I do it, um, I don't get much feedback, particularly parental feedback, on parents going through children who self-harm. So, self-harm itself, in a nutshell, I believe is more along the quick fix line. It's not, it's a coping mechanism, but it's not a true coping mechanism. So it falls more into that maladaptive category. With self-harm itself, it relieves the initial symptoms. So I've explained um, in one of my upcoming series all about self-harm that 
the four basic reasons that, that I know that I would do it would be some part of self-loathing you know, I get frustrated with why can't I do this I should be doing better or oh, I'm not good enough and so it wants me it makes me take it out on myself in that way another reason is to feel something if I'm in a depressive spiral then it can be easy to go numb and I just want to feel it can be used as a distraction technique if I'm having an anxiety attack um, inflicting that pain causing that pain is like a distraction imagine you've got a blinding headache and you stub your toe on the door well suddenly for a moment you've forgotten your headache because your toe hurts it's that sort of that sort of concept and then the last reason is to provide some form of physical evidence because the trouble with mental health is that it's exactly what it says on the tin it's mental there isn't always a physical symptom or physical indicator that you're not well if you had a broken leg you'd have a cast you'd have the broken leg itself you'd have crutches there'd be those indications but with mental health there isn't always anything of that nature so self-harm gives me cuts or gives me scars something that I can latch on to as some kind of physical sign so as I said it's it's a very short term thing it only temporarily alleviates the symptoms and in some ways it can exasperate them one thing that Theresa Larson said was that after you've self-harmed it does provide that temporary relief but then later on you get the guilt of having done it you get the embarrassment over having to cover up the the wounds or the scars and really if you're doing it to lower the stress levels it can actually exasperate it in the long run which I'd perfectly agree with it is something that can exasperate things in the long term it is just a temporary short quick fix but so that's one of the the big ones that I've used um, in terms of coping another one is isolation which again isn't isn't the best kind of thing when you suffer with anxiety different situations can trigger panic attacks and it's one of the things that I've struggled with whether it's when I'm at church or at, when I was at work or even something as simple as going to the shop to pick up a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk it can trigger panic attacks so one of the ways that, that I've gone through um, trying to avoid the panic attacks is to isolate myself it ties into the depression as well where you you don't you don't have the motivation to get out you don't want to see people um, but either either condition can cause that isolation and you get to a stage where you find that it's easier to stay inside easier to hide yourself than it is to go out and actually face these things but again it's not the healthiest of things because you're cutting off your your social life and then that leads to you feeling worse because you're not seeing people you're not getting out you're stuck in the same four walls but it is something that I have used to cope with it so those are really two of the big ones that I've used um, admittedly the isolation isn't so much of a coping mechanism as it is a symptom but self-harm certainly is very much of a, a coping mechanism for me but where does that leave us what alternatives can we use to fill in the um, fill in the void that taking these things out would create there are a couple of things um, that I've got in terms of suggestions so let's take a moment let's have a look at those see what kind of positive things we can put in um, just to, to get through and to keep going something to really hold on to you're listening to pushing back the shadows so some of the the more positive things that I've turned to there are a couple of things um, that I can suggest some of the positive ones that I've turned to um, things that you can you can start to enjoy that you can get yourself into um, me for example I always take games as one of my important ones um, role-playing games like Skyrim or Morrowind 
turn-based strategy games like Civilization V, things along those lines that you can actually get yourself into and spend an hour, two hours doing. Granted, it isn't the healthiest of coping mechanisms because sitting in front of a computer day in, day out, playing games isn't the best thing. But when you weigh it up against self-harm, it is certainly a much better alternative. Um, with games themselves, particularly things like those role-playing games I mentioned, um, Skyrim, it's something that I can get involved in, I can lose myself in a little bit if I want to, because for those of you who aren't familiar with the game, you create a character, you go off and explore a fictional world, and effectively you can be whoever you want to be, doing whatever you want to be, uh, doing whatever you want to do, even. And it's one of those things that you can really throw yourself into. It lets you forget what you're going through at that particular time, and especially if if it's late at night and you can't sleep, and there's nobody around on Messenger or on Facebook or text or whatever, it's a good way of just getting you through. No, you shouldn't be doing it all the time, but it is something that you can use, kind of almost as a an infrequent coping mechanism, something that you can do just to push yourself through. Another big one that I do use is music. So for those of you who don't know, I am a musician, I'm a, a singer, a songwriter, I play guitar, um, and I've got quite a broad taste in music itself. So whether it's sitting down with my guitar and just singing my heart out, whether it's putting like a, a couple of tracks on YouTube, or whether it's going onto iTunes or my iPod and getting some music out and just listening to it, singing along, it's something that I can use just to cope. A lot of the times I find that some of the music, um, certain songs do mean more in different times. One of my favourite quotes that you will find on the blog is that when we're happy, we listen to the music, but when we're sad or down, that's when we start listening to the words. And there are a lot of songs that I've really found I start listening to the words more when I'm, I'm down, and there are a couple of songs that I have as, as go-to songs. Um, one example of this would be Tell Your Heart to Beat Again by Danny Gokey. Um, another would be Breathe by Johnny Diaz. And that's two two great songs that, that I turn to when I'm really, really stuck or really down. Um, just great messages behind them. With um, other stuff like my guitar and that, I've written a number of tracks. I will be looking to release those at some point, so do stay tuned. Um, getting a, an album booking session um, in the works just so I can record them and then release them later on, so do stay tuned. But I find that I can express myself through music a lot. Those of you following the blog will see a lot of my written content. Writing is always something that I've been able to use. But music, and particularly songwriting, I've been able to get um, a lot of my thoughts, a lot of my feelings out there. And with music itself, um, it's easy to write it, um, as in to write how you're feeling. It's easy for you to read something on a blog. But music, I just find, creates that additional connection. It takes you it takes you another level deeper because you've got the audio there too. You can really just connect with, with the person's soul and how they're feeling. And it's one of the things that I've tried to use a lot in my own songwriting. So games, music, they're two of the big ones for me. Um, ones that I will turn to Normally when I'm in need of a safety net, something to stop me from getting to that self-harm stage, I usually start with music. If that fails, I'll move on to games. Occasionally if that fails, I'll try TV or I'll try a film. Um, but mostly games, music, they're two of the solid ones for me. Another big coping mechanism um, I've already touched on a little bit is the writing. I'm really able to write down how I'm feeling, write down some of the things going through my head. And um, it's one of the things that I try and use to turn it into some kind of something good. Back in episode one of 
the podcast, I did tell you why I started Pushing Back the Shadows, um, a blog designed to help other people going through similar things, partly by almost chronicling my experiences and some of the struggles that I go through, but also offering the explanations to the friends, to the family members who are trying to support people um, in those situations. So a lot of the time, writing is one of the the big things um, that kind of underpins everything else that I do for coping. It's one thing that a lot of um, therapists have recommended. They do say, journal what you're going through, write it down what you're feeling, because it it effectively works to take the thoughts out of your head and put them somewhere else. And normally once it's written down, you can forget about it. Another thing that I do with regards to writing is I do write novels, uh, not just blog posts. And it's interesting to see how some of those have changed, admittedly, in the last couple of months. Um, Now, in the last two months, it's not been such a big part of my life. I've written more blog posts than I have worked on my books. Um, However, there is an autobiography in the works, um, so stay tuned for that as well if you're interested in learning more about my story. It goes more in depth than the blog itself, gives you a bit more background, um, a bit more of an overview, and some of the darker moments in my journey. So stay tuned for that. I will be letting you know when it's coming up. but really, the other books that I write are kind of in the, the fictional um, fictional fantasy realm. So something akin to Lord of the Rings or The Wheel of Time, that sort of, of genre. And it's interesting to see how they've changed, because one of my characters has undergone um, the death of one of her close friends. Uh, somebody she'd been friends with for, for years and years and years, and that character died. And I sat there and I had the idea of turning her into giving her a kind of mental health depression struggle as one of the types of depression is reactive, usually after a bereavement. I thought it would be interesting to kind of explore this. So I started writing this character and I sent it to one of my friends to give me an opinion. And the first thing she said was, I really wasn't expecting you to put that much of yourself into one character Um, and it's interesting to see how my experiences have kind of shaped that character a little more and influenced my writing in that way but it's again it's um, linking back into the games it's another thing I can lose myself in I create the characters I write their stories and it's it's a fictional world fictional people they can do whatever they like and in some ways they can do well, given that it's a fan- fantasy genre um, where you have like sorcery and, and that sort of stuff as well, they can do a lot of things that I can't do. But it's things that perhaps I might wish that I could do or things that it would be great if I could do. Um, just things that I can lose myself in and really use as a distraction. So coupled with music, coupled with games, writing is another key and rather rather important part of, of what I do what I do to get through to keep going. Just off the back of writing with regards to the blog, it's as it's a way of trying to support other people going through similar things. It's a way of turning my curse, if you will, into a gift. If I can help one other person, it gives my struggle some kind of meaning. And it, in a sense, it makes it more bearable. So it's another big thing through, through the writing. But there are other things that I have turned to, um, one in particular that I'd really, really like to tell you about. You're listening to Pushing Back the Shadows. The last one that I really wanted to talk to you about is finding um, something or someone to hold on to something that can keep you going. It could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could be anything, um, a pet or a job, something that you can really hold on to. So mine comes in in two parts. The first one is the blog itself that I've already mentioned and being able to channel what I'm going through into something that can ultimately help people. 
The other one, though, is comes in the form of a person. So uh, about a couple of months ago, one of my friends approached me and um, asked if I would be willing to become the godfather to her three-year-old daughter. Um, and it was something that um, I hadn't really expected, but it was a, an incredible privilege to be asked that. And after the initial, um, wow, I can't believe you've asked me, yes, of course, that, that would be, I'd be honoured, that sort of reaction, I had a, a little think about it, and a thought occurred to me that even if everything else fails, even if everybody else vanishes, if I've got nobody around, I've still got somebody who I can use as a, a reason to keep going. It's one of those things that wakes me up with a smile on my face in the mornings. Um, now, I, I babysit my goddaughter. We're going to call her Emma, um, just as a pseudonym for anonymity. Um, I babysit Emma fairly frequently, and she doesn't care if I'm having a bad day. She doesn't care that I'm depressed. She doesn't care if... Um, if I wince because I've caught a cut or anything like that, she just thinks for whatever reason that I'm amazing. I know that sounds kind of a little big headed, but it's one of those things you pick up in their reactions. But it's really something that can keep me going. Just being able to, to get up, get out and put a smile on this little girl's face um, whether that's something simple like just sitting and playing shops with her or taking her to the park or taking her on a walk or whatever, whatever it happens to be that we're doing. It's something that I can hold on to. It's a little highlight for the day or occasionally depending on what she says or does, not so much of a little highlight, it's more of a, a big, a big thing. I found that with, um, with with regards to getting out of the house, it's become a lot easier. Um, normally, if I'm going to see her, if it's something else like going to the doctor or going to see other friends, it's more difficult still. And that's something that I'm really having to, to try and push myself with. But if it's going to see her and spend the day with her and the rest of her family, it's something that I can do off my own back. It's something that I don't need to to really force myself to do, um, it becomes easier the more I do it. So that's just one example of something important that I can I can hold on to. And especially if there are days where I feel like I can't keep going, days where I just want to give up, throw the towel in and say, no, I'm done, I'm really done, I can't do it. There's always that counterbalancing thought of, well, no, you've got a little girl who depends on you, who will be looking to you to shape her life, make the most of it. And I know that's not going to be the same for everybody. It's going to be subject to whether you have somebody like that in your life or whether it's um, a friend or a family member who might depend on you or even not even a dependency, somebody who would just really, really miss you if you weren't there. It's another reason that you can have to keep going. So let's take a look for a moment um, at the friends and family side, because I've listed a number of a uh, number of things that you can use if you are struggling, things that you can use to get through. But if you're a friend or a family member, what can you do to help this person? Really, the key thing is going to be to help them find something to hold on to. And please, please do be aware that it might not be you, but don't take that personally. You see, with um, with depression, it can skew a lot of those relationships, and it can be hard to think of everybody that you'd want to to hold on to. Um, but just encourage them to find something, whether it's games, music, writing, or even a person or a pet or something that they can hold on to, something that will give them that little little bit of light in their, in their day, something that they can start the day with a smile for. It will take some time to find that, 
it's not something that comes immediately but it is a very important thing as long as they've got something to hold on to it's easier for them to face the day I'd really recommend if you pop onto the blog itself to check out a post that I wrote called Just Hold On um, it's in the depression support category on the blog itself so have a look at that it kind of sums up a lot of what I've been talking about today and gives you a few other suggestions um, of what you can do to try and encourage somebody to hold on but also for you to hold on yourself another important point that I would make um, particularly for friends and family is for you to find something that you can do as well um, that can just alleviate those symptoms a little bit um, alleviate the stresses of trying to support somebody with depression it's important not to forget yourself but to remember to take the time um, to do something that you would enjoy as well otherwise you will get to a stage where you will burn yourself out and um, it'll then become very difficult to support somebody who has depression if you're burnt out with no energy but in a nutshell do encourage somebody to find that that thing that they can hold on to um, whatever it may be and it can be anything but something that they can hold on to with both hands and not let go something that they can use as a little light in their darkness as I say you've got a couple of examples there music games uh, writing or somebody that you can hold on to and there are more on the blog itself so do check that out it would uh, be very beneficial but that's all from me today um, I hope you guys are all doing well and as I say stay tuned for the autobiography that's coming out and also the album that I will be releasing hopefully in the near future and I shall catch you next time on the Pushing Back the Shadows podcast. My name's Alex. You have a good day, guys. You've been listening to Pushing Back the Shadows. To get more involved with us, visit us at pushingbacktheshadows.com and hit subscribe. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash alexdavispbts or tweet us at alexdavispbts.